Hi, and welcome. My name is Dr. Consuelo Greer. I use she and her pronouns, and I serve as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Bellevue College. I'm here today with my colleague, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, my name is Roderick Morrison. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the Vice President of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Tacoma Community College. The presentation we're going to share with you today is about action planning for leading institutions towards anti-racism. This presentation was shared in 2023 at NCOR, which is the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. We're excited to bring this presentation to the CTC system in Washington State. Starting considerations. One of the things that you want to think about as you're thinking about how to lead your institution, your team, your organization towards being a more anti-racist organization, you'll want to think about the state system or political environment for your institution. Is it a supportive one? Is it neutral? Or are there a number of barriers for advancing racial equity at your college or university? As you're thinking about this, we call this a starting consideration because it's important to know and to be able to contextualize how you are going to do this work within the environment that you're in. We'll talk a little bit more about our state system in just a moment. And even though our state system may have one context, your institution may be operating slightly different and we'll talk about that next. So we also wanted to share with you um, the vision statement from the State Board of Community and Technical College System that they issued in September of 2019. And it says that leading with racial equity our colleges maximize student potential and transform lives within a culture of belonging that advances racial, social, and economic justice and, and service to our diverse communities. So we wanted to start with presenting this vision statement because it is really important for us to acknowledge the fact that this is a charge that the state system has um, delivered to all colleges in, um, in the community and technical college system. And also um, we wanted to highlight the timing of when this, this vision was um, created and we and you'll see here that it's September of 2019 which nationally is well before a lot of institutions and organizations started to make this a high priority so we were we use this not only to keep ourselves in alignment with the vision that the state board has um created but also to hold all of us accountable to the mission set forth for all of us so we wanted to make sure that we shared this as um the state board is the largest governing body for all of our institutions and to show that the work that we're doing is not um a detraction or different from the work that um, the state board has asked all of us to do together. When we contextualize things and we think about the charge that the state board has had for us, it's really important and it helps to guide us, but it also helps us to keep our institutions accountable to this larger mission. It means that if we're all focused on this same mission and vision, we're going to be working together. This image here that we're showing provides a little bit of a graphic to help understand how we move away from an individual action to really think about institutional and structural actions. It's important as you think about theories of change and theories of change that impact how anti-racist um, actions and anti-racist action planning can move through an institution. And we call that institutionalization. It's the final phase or an end goal of establishing or embedding practices or customs into a system. It helps to ensure that it becomes the very fiber of the work that you do and not some parallel line of either programming or training or one-off initiatives that fail to get off the ground, but it's really about embedding this work within institutional structures. And when we think about this, we really wanna be thinking about institutional and structural things that are on the systemic side, if you're able to look and see on the right side of this infographic. It's about focusing on policies and practices at the organizational level that perpetuate racial oppression. It's about thinking about how the effects of racism interact and accumulate across institutions and history and the roles within our own institutions. It helps for us to be able to move us away from both individual and solely interpersonal interactions where we're focusing only on changing the hearts and minds of individuals or the personal beliefs that somebody is holding and actually really moving towards the policies and the things like that that will sustain either positive action towards removing institutional barriers or have maybe historically sustained negative actions holding up racist actions and systemic racism within our institutions. 
And going off of that, you'll see here that we've highlighted the three different phases of transformation for anti-racist um, for anti-racist transformation within institutions. So these are really to show the different phases and elements that exist when you're going through the process of that transformation. And I'll also note that these different phases are um, are needing to be assessed and analyzed for every single thing that you're doing at the college, right? So it, it isn't just about getting here in one fell swoop. Some In some places, you may be in implementation, and in other places, you may be in your mobilization phase. And ultimately, you're trying to get to institutionalization for everything that you're doing at, at your institution. So the first um, phase is mobilization, and that's really when you're starting to share out the information and plans of what you're hoping to do as an institution in any specific element or regard. So if you're saying we're going to commit to anti-racist hiring practices, the mobilization might be a number of professional development sessions where you talk about what that looks like, talking to various stakeholders at your institution to try to understand some of the gaps or inequities that currently exist in the hiring process, and then talking about the plans you have moving forward. It's really trying to create that groundswell of information and, and enthusiasm um, around the particular aspect that you're trying to address. Um, you see here that we've written leaders work to ensure the structures are in place and that systems are in place to propel and sustain innovations through the next phases. So this is also when you're um, trying to get everything prepared and in a row so that when you go to launch this um, particular initiative, you are prepared to have the resources, staffing, information prepared to, um, to, 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 to try to see what you can execute at your institution. So then you get to that next phase of the process, which is called implementation. That's when a system moves beyond systems and focuses on the procedural and behavioral levels of change in the institution. So this is really when you get into the action steps. This is when you start to put together the things that you've been mobilizing efforts around. You start to actually launch a new hiring search that, had, that implements some of the anti-racist practices that you've been discussing. You actually um, are, are, are having an opportunity to do the thing that you've been talking to everybody about doing to see how it's going to work. Um, and then you get to the next phase and final phase of the process, which is called institutionalization, which moves the work into the stage where a majority of the institution accepts the new values, norms, and ways of operating as part of the overarching culture and have adopted mechanisms for monitoring and evaluating diversity and equity-driven initiatives. So this is when your entire institution has embedded this particular practice or process in, in such a way that it's going to be self-sustaining. Um, it's not tied to particular people or particular initiatives. It's tied to the institutional DNA. Um, so using continuing with the anti-racist um, hiring practice uh, example, once you have every single hiring manager and every single hiring committee at your institution utilizing this same practice and you have infrastructure in place to ensure that it's going to be um, held accountable for those who do not and that there are there are processes in place to make sure that people can't go through their process without implementing these. Then you're, in your, then you're in your institutionalization phase. So you're really trying to get there with every single thing that you do, especially as you transform into an anti-racist institution. But it's very important that you go through all three of these phases to get there. Um, because again, you're trying to explain something to people that have not historically done that. Um, most, most schools that are transforming into anti-racist institutions, we're all doing it for the first time. So the mobilization and implementation phases are incredibly critical to try to get the institution to not only understand how it works, but to also provide practical and sustainable measures for how you're going to do it. And then, like I said, uh, you want to get to the institutionalization phase where the whole um, operation runs in that in that particular equitable and anti-racist manner. So the question we have for you and something that we want everyone to consider is where are you in this in, in, um, in this process? So again, you can be in mobilization in one particular element. If you're starting to have a conversation and identifying issues, and then you want to figure out what you can do to address them, that's your mobilization. You could be there in one thing, but you can already have started work in another different, in another space, and then you're in your implementation of that. Um, when Dr. Gray and I have conversations, we often acknowledge and realize that very few um, elements of institutions are in the institutionalization phase, because that means that the work has sustained itself to a, to a degree that it's going to happen regardless of the certain people or practices that are in place, and it's just embedded into the institutional core. So it's 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 difficult to get to that place quickly. It's also difficult to get to that place in general because of the the um, institutional barriers that just exist throughout the system and throughout the the, the country, um, preventing things from from advancing to this level. But it is important to assess where you are when you have these conversations and to always be checking in on where you are as you go through the process. 
as you think about where you're at for each one of those things, it's really important that we not lose sight of the point of having equity focused leadership. And really that is connected to student success. Frankly, we all wouldn't be here if it weren't for our students. So it's really important and we utilize these points here to really continue to keep us grounded through the processes as we um, end up within our teams and within our work and within our initiatives becoming siloed, we can't forget really what our North Star is. Um, we believe that our institutional success is truly measured by the success of our students who face the greatest systemic barriers to completion. So when we're contextualizing why we are leading with anti-racism or why we are leading with racial equity, this is why. As we begin to understand the depth and the history of inequitable racist policies and practices underlying higher education within the United States construct, we commit to understanding and correcting these unjust policies and practices. And that's part of the reason why, if you think back to that infographic, we really focus on the systemic level, really at the policy and practice level to try to move away from the individual and interpersonal. We recognize that correcting systemic harm to our black indigenous and other people of color across mm -hmm. our student populations or in our employee populations, that we must take intentional action both immediately and over time. There has to be engagement at all levels of leadership towards these goals. We cannot emphasize enough that the engagement at all levels of leadership are critical. There's an element that our trustees must do to support that our presidents, our cabinet and leaders all across the institution. When we better serve our BIPOC students and the community, we can best understand the issues facing higher education. We all have to be thinking about declining enrollments, decreasing retention, and flat completion. All of these things are critical components to student success. And when we embed anti-racist practices, policies, learning, and focus on institutionalization, we can address these better as an institution. So now we're going to get into the action planning process and what that looks like. Once you're in the acknowledgement and realization that there are certain areas of the institution that are not upholding the vision set forth by the SBCTC system and your particular institution, then you want to get into the action planning of how you address and ultimately remedy these issues. So an additional consideration that we have for you all is what resources and organizational structures do you have or need? to put you in the best position for institutional success. We'll talk in more detail about what some of those resources are and what some of those structures that we've identified as best identified practices are, but it's important for you to do a baseline assessment of where you are and what the, and what elements you need to um, put yourself in the best position of success going forward to help maximize the impact of your action plan. So, um, Questions that we that we want you all to, to under to um discuss as you go about your action planning are, you know, is anti-racism, equity, and inclusion at the core of our leadership commitment? Like Dr. Grizz said earlier, it is incredibly critical that all areas of leadership at the institution are on board in alignment and prepared to do the work that it takes to transform an institution into an anti-racist one. So yeah, it starts by understanding whether or not you've made an institutional commitment to even do this. You know, do we have a mission statement and do we talk about these goals within that mission statement? Do we have um, a presidential charge or do we have a leadership team agreement that we're going to ensure that these things are at the core of what we do so that they're not forgotten about? And I often remind people that it isn't changing the work you do. It's just doing it differently than you currently are doing it, right? You have to have additional considerations and provide a new lens to the work that you are doing to ensure that that um, equity is in the center of it, to ensure that you're leading with racial equity, to ensure that the current, that the historically racist practices that are embedded into institutional structures are being actively worked against, right? So um, that's a question that we need you to consider just where are we as an institution and how we made those commitments um, as an institution at this point. Next, uh, do you and your team have realistic and measurable goals for your role in creating quality educational opportunities for the diverse community of learners you are charged to serve in a, to, you are charged to serve to thrive in an evolving world? So again, that's meaning where are we as a department? Where am I as a um, in, in my role at my institution? And do we have um, goals that we can utilize and put into place to, to, to continue to give us um, the action planning and necessary steps to strategize on how we're going to, to um, contribute to this mission? So again, just, you know, you focus on the leadership and the institutional effectiveness, but you also want to focus on your realm of influence and your particular roles and responsibilities and how those are going to play directly into those goals as well. So you're setting goals for yourself, 
you're holding the institution accountable. Those are those are definite starting points to have the conversation on where we're going to go from here as we create our action plan towards transformation. So this is a critically important one. We always ask people, what story does your resource allocations tell? Do your resource allocations reflect anti-racism, equity, and inclusion as priorities for your area, your role, your institution, your division? Insert anything that you are planning for. This is important because essentially where we put our money, where we put our people, those are a direct reflection of what our priorities are. People will always often say that your budget is a reflection of your priorities. So if we're saying that equity and inclusion are critically important for our institution, we also have to ask the question, what resources have we put behind them? Have we ensured that we have adequately staffed uh, the people who are directly charged with leading these efforts? Do we have um, diversity offices that are office of one, or do we have teams focused on equity within student success as an office of one or one person charged with doing this and three other things at the same time? Have we put enough people behind this work? How can we ensure that we are accountable to those people, that we are doing appropriate evaluation throughout the duration of the process, that we are thinking about where we are at within these processes and ensuring that we have appropriately staffed and resourced any of number of these efforts to be able to be sustainable and become institutionalized across our system, our team, our division. So you wanna think about what it is you are directly responsible or influential in, and then ask those questions. As we are putting plans together, we have to say, who will do this thing? Do we have enough people behind this process? Do they have the money that they need? Do they have access to the right supports to be able to institutionalize this effort? Those are all resources. We often think only about budget, but I also think it's really, really important that we think about human resources in this and ensure that we are not taxing the same people over and over to do this work, but that we are appropriately resourcing and asking people to reflect that as they are thinking about either their FTEs, the number of people that they have within their divisions, all of those are resources and all of those must directly reflect the commitments that we're saying that we're making. So it's an important checkpoint really in your planning processes and as you're working with your team as a midpoint review to really ask that question. What story does our resource allocation tell when we are talking about anti-racism, equity, inclusion, affirming our BIPOC communities, et cetera? When we think about this, um, it's also important to think about how you prioritize long-term growth and sustainability towards leadership with a lens of equity and anti-racism. This speaks directly to your institutional structure. So we talk about this, and one of the ways to think about this is like our equitable outcomes. Have we, how are we assessing those along the way? Are we disaggregating by race, ethnicity? Are we disaggregating by socioeconomic status, first generation status, and other historically excluded populations? How are we thinking about how we will sustain the growth of these efforts from a leadership perspective with the lens towards anti-racism and equity? That question has to be part of your action planning while you're doing this. So we've got some midpoint check-in things, and we also have questions that you need to ask all along the way to ensure that you're actually planning in the way that you're hoping to. And another question that's going to be critical in your action planning process is how have you envisioned accountability within your structures to sustain these efforts? Um, in short, there's no way that you're going to be able to reach ultimate transformation and institutionalization without necessary accountability. And it doesn't have to be always accountability in a punitive sense, but accountability in a um, encouraging and calling in sense. How do we ensure that everybody's holding up their end of our commitment? How do we make sure that every every department and every division is doing their part in ensuring that we're getting the outcomes and the progress that we're trying to? So that's something that you have to talk about. I personally think it would benefit you to have that conversation before you need to enact those accountability structures. So you really want to talk about what is it that we're going to do if we fall if we fall short in this regard? 
What is it? What is it that we're going to do if we inevitably meet institutional resistance? What do we? What do? How do we hold people accountable to being a part of the direction that our institution is heading? In? Um, there's a lot of different examples and ways that you can do this, but you really want to figure out what works for your institution. And again, um, work away from the idea that accountability has to be punitive, but instead towards accountability being something that is just making sure that we're all holding up our end and all and all um, working in alignment and commitment what will we say we're going to do in, in, as a part of our transformation? So these two questions are going to be really important as you begin to talk about institutional transformation and the structure of it. Can you go back just briefly? I want to add that if you prioritize growth and sustainability within the leadership aspect, it makes the accountability conversation that much easier as well. Because you can talk about accountability when you are also making sure that we have leadership coming from a number of places and a number of levels. Leadership can't only be in title for any of these efforts. Leadership also has to be supported across the institution, across the team, across the division, and particularly for those who are on the front lines and who will be dealing with whatever the initiative is in the um, with the most hands on, I would say. And a practice we've we've noticed and identified is that um, you know the top down approach, so to speak, does prove to be effective when you're going through an institutional transformation or shift. So it isn't just about creating sustainable growth or um, sustainability and long term growth from the leadership perspective, but it does have to start there to give the communicate the communication and messaging to the entire institution that that's the direction you're headed in. So I completely agree agree with what Dr. Greer just said. And again, these are things that we want you to consider as you're starting that conversation, and even as you're going throughout the process to continue to check in and ask yourself these things. So these are just questions with, that we want to- Yeah, we leave you with a couple questions really around impact. What will you do? What will others see differently or more clearly from you? How will you demonstrate these new changes or how will people know that this is a different process than what it's looked like before. You must be explicit in the things that you say. You must ensure that you are following up uh, with your teams and those who are being asked to do the work. You must be able to circle back and ensure that as you're having those midway check-ins and areas where you might need to pivot, that you're including all parties and that people will actually see that you're doing something different. And if I can just say one more thing about that second question is that, you know, I really do want to key in on the word different. I think that something that a lot of institutions run into is, is the comfort of the familiar. And you really want to make you want you want to remind yourself constantly that the thing that we're trying to do is different. Therefore, how I present myself, what my perspective is, the work that we're doing must be different as well. And like I said earlier, it isn't about adding on. It's about reframing. It's about changing the work that you're currently doing. Maybe these are just some steps that you haven't currently had in a particular process that you need to add to, to, to make this an equitable one or to make this an anti-racist one. But it's about showing up and presenting and having different results than what you've typically had. I think that um, that's incredibly critical to remember when you're going through your mobilization phase. It's important to remember when you're going through your assessment, things should look different. So that is um, something else that we just want to remind you of and, and, and have you take with you as you begin and, and have your conversations. So that is um, our presentation for today. We want to thank you all for, for watching. And if you have any questions, we provided our contact information here. Um, you can reach out to us directly for any further conversation. We, we welcome the opportunity to have those conversations with you as you go about your action planning and transformation towards anti-racism. Um, and, and, and again, thank you for watching. And we look forward to continued conversation and everybody continuing the work that we know that we've recognized is so important. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.